Paul has come back from his missionary journeys and he now is standing before the Jewish Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. 23rd chapter of Acts from the first verse and Paul looking intently at the council, the Jewish Sanhedrin said, Brethren, <clears throat> I have lived before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by to strike him on the mouth. And then Paul said to him, God shall strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of the people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees, who were the modernists, or the liberals of their age, and the other, the Pharisees, who were rather dead conservatives, he cried out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of the Pharisees. And with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees, being modernists, say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. But the Pharisees, being conservatives, Acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn in pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified about me at Jerusalem, you must bear witness also at Rome. Amen. And the Lord will add a blessing to the reading from his holy word to his name be honor and praise. <clears throat> In the 23rd chapter of Acts, we find Paul standing before Ananias, the high priest and before the Jewish council. And in fact, this is the prelude to uh, three other encounters. Uh, the first is Paul's encounter with uh, Felix, the governor, and his wife Drusilla, as Paul reasoned about justice, self-control, and judgment. Felix, Trembled. That was the first encounter. The second encounter is with King Agrippa II and his wife Bernice. And as Paul preached to Agrippa, he said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And the third encounter is with Caesar, because Paul is now making for Rome. And so there is a whole chain of events here. And it's a chain of events 
that you see starting back in the past few chapters in the course of the third missionary journey and uh, towards the end of it Paul is pushing towards Jerusalem and he is determined to reach Jerusalem and all sorts of voices try to pull him back and deter him from going to Jerusalem but he is determined to get there. There is a whole chain of events that brings Paul before the Sanhedrin in this chapter. In the last chapter, he was before the Jewish mob. In this chapter, he is before the Sanhedrin. And then he is before the governor, Felix. And then he is before the king, Agrippa. And then he is before the emperor, Caesar. And I think there is a strategy here in Paul's life. <clears throat> it was his speaking to the mob that brought him to the Sanhedrin. It was his speech before the Sanhedrin that brought him to Felix. It was his speech to Felix that brought him to King Agrippa. And it was his address to King Agrippa that brought him to Caesar in Rome. And the picture that you have here is of a planned Christian life. It's a life with purpose in it. It's a life with direction. It's a life with a goal and an aim. It's a Christian life that is going somewhere for Jesus. And there is something immensely impressive about that kind of lifestyle. Planning ahead and thinking through the consequences of your actions and pushing forward into the will of God for your life. Now, of course, in all of this, you commit your way to the Lord and you ask God to have his way in your life. You ask him to do his will in your will. But in all of that, you plan and you think and you reason and you organize your life for Jesus. And there is something impressive about that in Paul's life here. Now, of course, the opposite of this is just to allow your life to happen to you. One of the great philosophies of our age is called existentialism. And literally, existentialism is the philosophy of existence. And it was propounded by atheists in France. And one of the basic tenets of existentialism is that everything that happens to you happens by chance. There is no meaning in life. There is no purpose in life. <clears throat> there is no God working out a goal or a purpose in your life. There is no purpose in your life. There is no purpose in my life. Not in anyone's life is there any purpose because everything that happens to us happens by chance, as it were, it falls out of the sky and there's nothing you can do about it. And many very ordinary folk nowadays who know nothing about existentialism are in fact infected and poisoned in their daily lives by this philosophy, whether they know it or not. A great many people nowadays live as if things just happened to them and as if life were just a matter, matter of chance. Uh, you sometimes uh, see it in the law courts um, where the prisoner in the dock will say, well, Your Honor, um, I look down and there happened to be this knife in my hand. <clears throat> or, I happened to have a wee drop of cannabis in the house at the time. Or, I just happened to be there when the lads were sniffing glue. Or I just happened to be going down the motorway 
at 93 miles an hour. Or, it was like this, Your Honor. I, I happened to be drunk at the time, and that's how it all started. Happened. Unplanned. As if life was not a consequential thing. Well, <clears throat> if you drink enough alcohol, you will get drunk. And happening doesn't come into it. If you put your foot hard enough on the throttle, you will find yourself traveling down the motorway at 93 miles an hour. And serve you jolly well right. And if you pick up a knife and stab someone, the knife is in your hand. And you are responsible for what you have done. It didn't happen to you. Happened doesn't come into it. And it's like that too with the Christian life. There are many Christians who drift through life and allow life to happen to them. But a Christian life ought to be a planned life and a life that is thought out under the will and the grace of God. It ought to be a life filled with purpose and traveling towards a goal. Paul spoke to the mob, and that brought him to the council. He spoke to the council, and that brought him to the governor Felix. He spoke to Felix, and that brought him to King Agrippa II. He spoke to King Agrippa II, and that brought him to the emperor Caesar in Rome. It was a planned Christian life. That's the first lesson in this passage here. The second thing to notice is this, <clears throat> that he is uh, standing before the Jewish council. And in this speech in Acts 23, we have another example of uh, what we've been calling an apology. Now, the word apology comes from apologia in the Greek, and there are several apologias in the Bible. Paul made an apologia before the mob in the last chapter. Stephen, earlier on, before his martyrdom in the book of Acts, made an apologia to the crowd. Uh, nowadays, of course, the word apology it means something that's uh, shoddy or shabby. We use the word apology in connection with a half-hearted thing. We say that we apologize for something. But in Paul's day, an apology was a very respectable thing. It was an official speech. It was a defense in which you justified your actions and you justified the ways of God with men. And that's what Paul is doing before the Jewish council here. Uh, it's not too much to say that sooner or later every Christian is called upon to do this in the world, to offer the world and the worldlings and the secularists and the materialists an apology for the gospel of Christ. We are to commend Jesus Christ and to defend Jesus Christ and to justify the ways of God with men. Sooner or later, every Christian is called on to make that kind of apology to the world. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, uh, Peter says that Christians ought to be able to stand up at any time and give a reason for the hope that is in them. We are to give a reason for the hope that is in us. Not an emotional account, as we sometimes do. We are not simply to tell the world about our feelings and our experiences. Peter says, we are to give a reason for the hope that is in us. We are to apologize in the best way for Jesus Christ and the gospel. And in this apology here in Acts 23, there are three very important elements. And I'd like to draw your attention to these uh, this morning. The first is the witness of a good conscience. 
We find this referred to in verse 1. And Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived before God in all good conscience up to this day. The witness of a good conscience. And uh, <clears throat> some idea of the importance of conscience in the Christian life is gathered from the way in which Paul insists on it time and time again in his letters. In fact, later on in his address to Felix in chapter uh, 24, he says, I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards God and towards men. The witness of a clear conscience was an important part of his testimony. He mentions it again in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4 and verse 2, where again he is apologizing for his ministry. And he says, We have renounced disgraceful and underhand ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Later on in First Timothy, when he's writing to his son in the faith, he says, Timothy, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Notice these three elements in Christian witness. A pure heart, a, a one-track heart, a single-track heart. A pure heart, a good conscience, a conscience that is clean and alive, and a sincere faith, which uh, literally means a faith without wax. It's a reference to the old uh, practice of the Romans of patching up their statues with wax. If a, if a statue cracked in the Mediterranean sun, um, a shoddy workman would come along and fill up the cracks in the statue with uh, wax. Now the Latin word for wax is sera. And sine sera meant without wax. It's the origin of the English word sincere. And a sincere faith is a faith without wax. It's a faith that hasn't been papered over or patched up. The aim of our charge is a love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. The letter to the, uh, he, the author of the letter to the Hebrews also mentions the power of, and the importance of conscience in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 where he speaks about <clears throat> the power of the blood of Christ to purge our consciences from dead works to serve the living God. The blood of Christ is to purge our consciences from dead works. Not just dead wrong works, but dead good works. The blood of Christ is sometimes called upon to burn out our virtues as well as our vices before we can come to a saving knowledge of Christ. The blood of Christ burns out dead works from our conscience so that we can serve the living God. And this is an important part of apologizing for Christ in the world today. When the worldlings and the secularists and the materialists look at us very often they're not so much interested in our words or our teaching or our claims. 
the thing that they see first of all is our lives. We are to be living letters known and read by all men. Living letters. We are to have consciences that are alive. I recall having a very violent argument with a, a, a Christian brother in the Evangelical Union in student days. He was called Joe. can't remember his second name. He came from Fraserborough and he was a member of one of the Pentecostal churches in Fraserborough. And he held adamantly that Christians don't have consciences and don't need consciences. He said Christians have the Word of God to guide them. They don't need conscience. Christians have the Spirit of God to guide them by the Word. Christians don't need consciences. But it is the witness of Scripture that we all have consciences and that we all need conscience. This is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world is the light of conscience. Every man has a hidden alarm and a built-in warning system. There is inside your heart a hidden alarm. The light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Of course, it's possible to have a dead conscience there are people with consciences that are hard and dead and callous. There are people who sit under the sound of the gospel of Christ and the oftener they hear the gospel as the years pass, the deader they become and the deader the consciences become until at the last they can hardly hear the voice of Christ speaking to them. You know, there are people here this morning who have heard the voice of Christ for years and the voice has got weaker and weaker and Christ has got further and further away because they've allowed their consciences, that inner alarm, to become dead and hard and callous to the gospel of Christ. You see, a conscience needs to be fed in order to stay alive. A conscience is like a baby. If you don't feed a baby, the baby will die. Your conscience needs to be fed on the Word of God. It needs to be kept alive by the Spirit of God. Your conscience needs to be fed on Christ if it is to be a living conscience. That's the first thing in a Christian testimony. The witness of a good conscience. I have lived before God in all good conscience up to this day. The second important thing <clears throat> is the witness of meekness. And I think we all ought to learn a great lesson from Paul's mistake in verses 3 to 5. You remember that um, he told the high priest that he was a whitewashed wall. And uh, he seems to have in mind there the words of Jesus himself. You remember that Jesus told the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they were just a collection of whitewashed tombstones. On the outside they were beautiful, but on the inside they were filled with dead men's bones. You are just a collection of lovely gravestones, said Jesus to the Pharisees. But the question arises, should Paul have speak, spoken like that to the high priest? And he admits in verse 5 that he should not. Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written in the law, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of the people. And in fact, Paul's mistake there it contrasts very markedly with the testimony of Christ. It is written of Jesus that when he was reviled, 
he reviled not again, and he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is dumb before its shearers. <clears throat> the greatest victories in the Christian life are always the victories of meekness. And it was a lesson that some of the greatest giants of the faith have needed to learn. Paul needed to learn it here. He had no right to speak to the high priest like that. Jeremiah needed to learn it when he started naming names in his sermons. Ezekiel needed to learn it when he started using abusive language of the people of God. Elijah needed to learn it when he thought that you could bring in the kingdom of God by violence. John the Baptist needed to learn it. He was an Elijah and he thought you could bring in the kingdom of God with violence. But the greatest victories of the faith are victories of meekness. Learn to scorn the praise of men, says Faber's hymn. Learn to lose with God, for Jesus won the world through shame and beckons thee his road. Go to the Soviet Union. Go to Czechoslovakia and see Christians winning the victories of meekness. There is a time, according to the Bible, there is a time to stand back and to let evil have its way, even if it is very costly for you. There is a time to become a nobody for Christ's sake, even if it hurts you. There is a time to stand by meekly and take the insults. I wonder if you know Emily Dickinson's great little poem, two little verses about becoming a meek nobody for Christ's sake. Very amusing they are too. <clears throat> I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They banish us, you know. How dreary to be a somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell your name the live long day to an admiring bog. How dreary to be somebody. Haven't you seen that in Christian churches? People who like their pomp and their position. People who are consumed with their vanity and their importance in the church of Christ. Isn't it pathetic? Isn't it sad? Wouldn't it make the very angels weep? To see pompous men filled with their own little importance in the church of God. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell your name the live long day to an admiring bog. Jesus won the world through shame and beckons thee his road. The witness of meekness. And uh, lastly, there is the witness of a sanctified imagination. In verse 6, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees, he started to speak about the resurrection because he knew that the resurrection was the apple of discord 
between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You see, the Sadducees were the modernists. They were the liberal people. They didn't believe in angels or spirits or life after death. They didn't believe that dead men could rise. And the Pharisees believed all these things. And when Paul saw that half the gathering was made up of Sadducees and the other half of Pharisees, he started speaking about the resurrection. I think there is room, you know, for a thing called Christian cunning, Christian guile, and Christian initiative. There is the witness of a sanctified imagination. Jesus told us that we were to be as harmless as doves. He also told us that we were to be as wise as serpents. And I'm sure many churches in the world today are dying for lack of sanctified imagination. We had an interesting appeal at our uh, minister's conference at Creef recently. Sometimes we get letters from America, you know, uh, offering pulpit exchanges. And I've often wondered if I should go over for three months and let you hear an American for three months. And I was greatly tempted by this one. A letter came from the USA from a good evangelical man there, and he said, please send us one of your Scottish ministers, and I'll come over to you. And if it's any temptation, one of the Rockefellers is a member of the congregation. And maybe you will succeed where I have failed. <laughs> well, we need 50,000 pounds for this roof, and it would be nice to be a friend of the Rockefellers. But did you know where the Rockefellers made their money? They made it from the Battle of Waterloo. Because one of the Rockefellers was at the Battle of Waterloo, not fighting. He sat on a hill watching the battle. And when he saw how the battle was going and realized who was going to win, he had arranged for a horseman to take the message to the French coast. He had arranged for a boatman to take the message to the south coast of England, where he had arranged for another horseman to take the message to London, where he rearranged all his stocks and shares. So that by the time the news finally reached London, Rockefeller was a multi millionaire. Jesus said, the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. That's from his parable of the dishonest steward. The children of this world are wiser than the children of light, but it ought not to be so. Here then are three excellent rules for apologizing for Christ in the world, for giving a reason for the hope that is within you. First of all, there is the witness of a good conscience. Keep conscience as the noonday clear, says the hymn. Secondly, there is the victory, the witness of meekness. Submission in the name of Christ. And thirdly, there is the witness of a sanctified imagination, a mind that is transformed and quickened and made alive, a mind that devises great things for God. Amen. May God add a blessing to the preaching of his word. To his name be honor and praise.